Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the very much long awaited video, how to do your plumbing on your coffee food truck. Now, for those of you that are new to my channel, my name is Vincent, this is Green Joe Coffee School. We help people start mobile coffee businesses, truck trailers and carts, and we do it through a variety of means, eBooks, courses, consultations, live in-person classes. I'll link my website in the comments. You can check that out if you like. Uh, in this video, we are covering how to install plumbing for a coffee truck. Now, for those of you that are interested in food trucks, this is gonna translate really well because the coffee truck world, our water is a little Bit, that's where our product comes from so you know we have to do things like regulate pressure and um, we even go off the deep end on parts per millions when it comes to ions you guys don't have to worry about some of that stuff so it's gonna be pretty straightforward for you all right uh, a few housekeeping notes this is gonna be a long video so I'll put timestamps in the description feel free to use those so you can kind of jump ahead also there are some links to some of the equipment that I was able to get um, things like water tanks but then some of this stuff is just better to go down to your local hardware like your schedule 40 PVC okay all that being said, let's just jump right into this. All right, first and foremost, uh, plumbing has risk. There's liability involved with this, so I'm gonna throw it out there right off the bat. You gotta do this at your own risk. You got hot water heaters. Those are under pressure. If improperly installed, you run the risk of explosion. That's why they have expansion valves and, and pipes and stuff. So just kind of understand that this may be a do-it-yourself job or it may not be. Ultimately, your codes and regulations are gonna be the ones that really will tell you whether or not you can do this or if you have to hire someone who's licensed and bonded. Counties like Dallas, Fort Worth, we're going to see a lot of those regulations where they'll only allow those type of, of build outs from people that uh, may have their certificates. Um, but for a lot of us, we're not regulated by those codes and regulations and we're able to uh, do the majority of the work as a do-it-yourself job. And so this video is made to kind of educate that process. Okay, so let's start off with what are you going to need? Supplies and materials. You'll need a triple sink and faucet, and that includes uh, sink fasteners, hand washing sink and faucet, and that also includes uh, sink fasteners, a bartender rinser, a coffee filter, water pump and accumulator, sediment filter, hot water heater, fresh water tanks with the inlets. Um, I use uh, both a gravity fed as well as a three quarter inch garden hose inlet. Gray tanks, um, that includes P-traps, vents, and your RV drain to hook up to your gray tank. Um, if you're hooking up your espresso machine, you might need a BSP fitting, British Standard Piping fitting. Kitchen sink drain pipes, uh, one and a half inches is what I used. Schedule 40 pipes, one and a half inches. Now, friendly reminder, schedule 40 pipe in your kitchen sink drain pipes, even though they're both one and a half inches, they are not the same size and you ultimately need an adapter. One and a half inch threaded adapters, and that's to fit a one and a half inch threaded pipe to one and a half inch PV, schedule PVC. P-traps, uh, espresso machine, bartender rinser. For that, you'll also need a uh, dishwasher tailpipe, braided vinyl hose for your espresso machine drain, braided vinyl hose for your water inlet, and most of the time those hoses are required to be food grade. A vent, or possibly a studer vent, if your uh, code and regulations allow for it. PEX piping, I used half inch. For that, you'll also need a crimper, a tool pipe cutter, elbows, tees, uh, crimps, ball valves, half inch female fittings, just as a pro tip, we're gonna need a bunch of these. Your faucet, your water heater, your bartender rinsers, all of those use half inch female pipe threads, so half inch FPT. Uh, aluminum hanging strap, Teflon tape, PVC, glue and primer, um, a whole saw kit, drill, jigsaw, straight edge level, silicone, plumber's putty, and 3 8 compression to 3 8 BSP fitting if you need the BSP fitting for your espresso machine. Vince, what the heck is a BSP fitting? It stands for British Standard Piping. It's the standardization they use in Europe, and so if you have an Italian espresso machine, you need an adapter to go from that 3 8 BSP to 3 8 compression that we use here in the US. And they almost are a fit, but not quite enough. You spray water all the way uh, everywhere if you don't get that fitting. So you definitely need to get that. So next up, let's talk about where in the coffee truck we're gonna put our, our uh, pipings and tanks and stuff. Okay, so this depends on the layout of the trailer. Most likely you're gonna put it towards the nose. It also depends on whether or not you need integrated drain board, my good folks in California, versus you do not need integrated drain boards. Um, you'll have to see your code and regulations ultimately to 
determine that. So let's kind of talk about some pros and cons to having a standalone sink versus a sink that you drop down into your counter. So standalones, they do not require a counter. They just, they stand alone. So it comes with its own legs. Uh, one of the pros is it's easier to install. It has integrated drain boards, which are great. Typically I can go onto Craigslist and find them used. So that's pretty awesome as well. Some of the cons are that the legs are often not tall enough to fit a gray tank underneath. So you might need uh, leg extensions. Now, when you go to buckle these things down, you gotta find a stud on your unit. And just as a pro tip, if you decide to go that route, it's a good idea to tighten your faucet hoses that feed your water supply to your hot and your cold prior to buckling everything down. Cause once you do buckle these things down, they're kind of hard to get your hand up into and, and tighten things. So drop-in counters or drop-in countertop sinks. The pros to these is they're cheap. Um, often you can just drop them into a laminate countertop or a butcher block countertop if your code regs allow it. Um, they got a nice aesthetic look to them. You can put the backsplashes on them. That has a good look to them. The cons are they require cabinetry. So that's an extra thing you got to buy, an extra thing you got to install. There could be some pros to that because you'll have more storage space if you get ones that have cabinets. That cabinetry is often difficult to level. And that is very true. It's things like laminate, you know, they're not made for mobile applications. So they're not quite as strong as things like butcher block. So you got to be kind of mindful of that. You figure, okay, it's probably going to last me about maybe five years. I might have to switch it out. Oh, uh, just as a pro tip, if you do go to uh, drop in countertops and you, you decide to go with like a laminate countertop, glue alone will not work. If you're looking through your YouTube, you're going to see a lot of these guys are just using glues to um, sink their countertops down to the cabinetry. In the mobile industry, you have to back up every glue with a screw. So every type of glue needs some type of mechanical attachment so that you have two sources of attachment to keep everything secured. Remember, you are bumping up and down the road. You are in a lot of hot, cold fluctuations. So things like glue, unless they're backed up with a screw, they don't last very long. So other considerations, a weight distribution, uh, milk, water, you're looking at eight pounds per gallon. So you got to be mindful of, the, of that, putting all your tanks on one side, especially if you're, if you're thinking about doing a single axle trailer where um, weight distribution becomes extremely important. For those of you that are doing horse trailers, watch my videos long enough, you know I'm a big advocate of double axle trailers. They, they haul 7,000 pounds. Then that's not going to be as important, but for those of you that are doing like the vintage campers, that's where you really got to be mindful of your weight distribution and you'll want to try to get your tanks on opposite side towards the front if you can. Uh, other considerations are going to be whether or not you put your gray tank close to your sinks or your freshwater tank close to your sinks. I like to have my gray tank closer to my sink because one, um, PEX is cheaper to run than, than PVC is and it's a lot easier to put in. It's easier to do with your T's, your elbows. Also, when you go to drill through cabinets, the hole's smaller. So it's just easier to run PEX. So if I have to choose between having my gray water tank close to my sinks versus my freshwater tank close to my sinks, I'm gonna run my freshwater further away from my sinks uh, and keep my gray closer. A couple other notes, um, vertical tanks. If you go to put a vertical tank in, they do bow over time. So you may want to put in some type of brace to prevent that bowing. And another pro tip, water uh, heaters, water pumps, and espresso machines. Those are the ones that are most likely to freeze over during your, your winter time. So I like to put those things pretty close together. That way, if I need to run like a, a space heater or you know like a, a radiant heater in my unit, I can put it close to those to the heater, the pump, and the espresso machine to prevent it from freezing over. Okay, and a couple other things. If your gray valve and your freshwater inlet are on the same side of your unit, then you most likely have to put your freshwater in inlet higher than your RV drain. And that's kind of common sense. You don't want to put a bunch of your, your RV drain above your freshwater inlet because then when you're disattaching your RV, all your gray water is going to get all over your inlet. So that's a no-brainer to me, but just wanted to point it out because it's it's definitely is part of the code and regulation. So a few more considerations with placement on 12 to 16 foot trailers, especially uh, those with the countertops on the driver's side and you know that passenger door on the passenger side, consider putting your uh, fresh water on the driver's side under the espresso machine. The pump and the hot water heater and all that can live right there, real easy to heat for winterization. And then consider putting your gray tank towards the nose of the unit. You can either put it by the triple sink or you can also put it on the other side of the unit as well. When you're picking out where to put your sinks, 
on the actual countertop. So if you're lying the, the laminate down and you're deciding where your sinks sh should go as far as close to the wall and as close to this wall, you wanna do a couple things. One, if you are gonna put in drain boards, if you're most of the time you're mandated for drain boards, you wanna be at least 12 inches from any wall so that your triple sinks have some space. Also on this one, just double check your code and regulations because Cali is notorious for having like integrated drain boards and integrated is exactly what it sounds like. The drain boards and the sink are all one piece of metal. So there's no separation between drain boards and sink. So we know we have to make room for the drain board on the whatever I'm gonna call that, the X axis, but on the, the Y axis, how close to the, the actual driver's wall you should be. We try to put ours, um, I'll put it this way. The further away from that wall, the more room you're gonna to have to, to work underneath the sink and attach those um, the plumbing fittings. But be mindful that there is a little bit of splash when you're washing dishes, so it is nice to have a little bit of lip up front so that you're not making a big mess. When to make the installation? Plumbing happens a little bit later in the build. It's after the floors, it's after the counters. If you're doing a professional plumber, you're hiring up, your code and regs require that, or you know it's just easier for you, which I'm all about. You want to give these guys at least two days. Now, professional plumbers will often say they only need one day, but it's been in my experience that what ends up happening is they rush the job towards the end of the day. Um, I don't want to deal with any of that. So ideally for me, I like to give them two days or at least at the bare minimum a day and a half. Now, if you decide to do it yourself, give yourself at least four to six days. It takes a lot longer than I thought. So one day for cutting countertops, installing the sinks. If you're doing a standalone, obviously you don't have to worry about that. You're gonna need another day to dry fit all your fresh water, another day to crimp everything down and test it out. You'll need another day to fit all your gray water plumbing and then another day to glue it down. And of course, a full day for mistakes. All right, so how much did it cost? Okay, so here's the breakdown for the plumbing for PEX and PVC. I spent $433.93. Um, for water tanks, $326.59. I got a 40 gallon and a 46 gallon. Pump and accumulators, 139. Hot water heaters, 180.82. Um, a sewer hose, uh, 39 bucks. Triple sink was 459.72. Hand washing sink, $51.74. Let's see, the pitcher rinsers, 129.98. Inlets, outlets, and vents, 101.35. NSF hose, 25 bucks. Water filter, 230.61. And the grand total came out to $2,117.74. So how to install. Let's first start off with the sinks. Now with the sinks, it is gonna be measure, 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 and measure again. So you're gonna measure your hole to drop your sinks. Uh, I found that if I give it an eighth of an inch larger than the actual basin itself, there's really no room for the, the sinks to play and you get a nice tight fit. Um, another pro tip is that when you're cutting the hole to fit your sink, instead of having your corners be 90 degrees, try to get them as round as the basins of the actual sink itself. And this is just gonna make sure that your basin has a nice snug fit. So to cut our holes, we first measured our line. Um, we had a second person double check um, just to make sure it's, everything is, is measured correctly. Once I had my area marked off, then I drilled into the countertop using a drill bit that was at least the width of my jigsaw, and I used a jigsaw to cut the actual hole out of the laminate countertop myself. Just kind of a pro tip here, I had a hard time getting my drill bit uh, to line up exactly on my line. It was a little funky, so what I would do is I would drill a hole a little bit towards the inside of my line in the in the area that I was gonna discard anyways, and then I would start cutting my, my jigsaw cut essentially essentially from inside that discarded area to meet up with exactly where my line is. So another pro tip, consider how your faucets are gonna be installed. Are, are the faucets part of the sink or do you need to have holes cut into your, your countertops as well? So it's good to kind of mark that off before you get started. So for my hand washing sink, I followed the exact same procedure that I did for cutting my triple sink. You know, you find out where you wanna be on your X and Y axis and you basically measure off the distance of your basins and that lets you know exactly 
uh, the whole size that you need to cut. Remember, you're not cutting this to fit the size of your sink, otherwise your sink will fall right through the counter. You need it to fit the basins, that way the lip of the sink gets snug on your counter. Okay, so we used sink fasteners to fasten the sink down. We didn't silicone the edges quite just yet. We wanted to make sure everything was in place. The silicone came afterwards once we got all the piping in, uh, squared away. Okay, so once the sinks are in, then I went to the water tanks and secured the water tanks. Now, just a side note on the water tanks. The tanks that I ordered, they come with a half inch threaded inlet as well as a one and a half inch threaded inlet. The half inch threaded inlet, it, it's clear all the way through. You can see inside the tank itself. But if you look at the one and a half inch inlet, those actually have a tank wall. You'll see that you have to cut that part out. That's gonna create a puck. You just use a hole saw to, to cut that out. You know, we made the mistake when we first did it. Our puck went all the way through. And man, that those things are hard to get out, you know, once you get it in there. So maybe consider cutting out the wall from the inside of your one and a half inch threaded before you secure everything down. So with the sinks and the tanks both being locked down, at this point, it's just running pipe between them. Also, our water tanks, everybody's water tanks, needs to be sloped to drain. And the plumbing code is a quarter inch per foot. What that means is you need one side of the tank to have some elevation so that the water actually drains into your, your piping. Obviously, it's the, the side that the pipes are not on. That side needs to be slightly elevated, quarter inch per foot. So I think I was working with like a 48 inch tank. So I need a, a full inch of elevation. So for that elevation, we just painted some two by fours. You know, they're not exactly two by four, but that's what we painted. So that's plenty of slope. And we just cut it the size of the tank, slipped it right under there. So that worked perfect. To secure my tanks, I just use aluminum hanging straps, believe it or not. That stuff worked great. We used a bunch of them. Okay, so I placed two straps along the length of the the tank itself, one strap along what I would call the depth. Also consider putting a footer down at the front of the tank. You can just use like a one by one inch piece of wood, but you know, something that's gonna stop the movement of the tank forward. That's that's really the, the big one you wanna be concerned about is forward and backward movement. Um, and that's just because people have a tendency of pulling out in front of coffee trailers and jumping on their brakes. So you're gonna kind of slam your brakes every now and then. You don't want your tanks to move. The the rocking back and forth, that happens on the turns. Um, you know, most of us are aware that we have a very piece of uh, expensive equipment in the back. We're not going to hit turns at 40. So on to fresh water piping. So a couple things, pro tips with the fresh water uh, with PEX. I like PEX. Um, PEX, it's stretchable. Um, so in the winter, if your pipes so-called freeze, then they'll have a little bit of stretchability. You don't have to worry about the popping as much. Um, it's cheaper. It's easier to install. So I'm going to go with PEX all day. Over, over copper. Now PEX, they give you two options. You can either crimp them down, you gotta buy the tool to crimp them down, or you can do shark bites. The shark bites I've had leak on me, the crimps I've yet to have leak on me, and so I'm not into the shark bites at this point. And as, as far as the PEX itself, it doesn't matter the colors, like m most code and regulate, I haven't seen any code and regulation that makes you pick a blue and a red. So we usually just get the 100 foot uh, white and we just use it both for um, hot water as well as cold water. They started putting out a couple different diameters of PEX, you're gonna see like PEX A, PEX B. I just get the regular old PEX, just half inch is what I use, half inch PEX. For the fresh water inlets, the way we set it up is we have two inlets. One is a three quarter inch garden hose inlet, so I can attach garden hose. Um, the other inlet is what's called gravity fed, and that's for like, say you have a five gallon bucket of water and you wanna uh, dump it into your tank, you can use a, a gravity fed inlet. My gravity fed inlet also serves as my vent. So it has a screen, it's vented, and so that allows uh, me to add water to my freshwater tank without it bowing. Okay, so I used three quarter inch garden hose fittings and it's just basically three quarter inch inlet. And from that, I fit it to a half inch FPT that stands for female pipe thread. It's part of the national pipe thread system. So I used half inch uh, FPT directly to the PEX. And from there it goes, you know, we just use a series of elbows to get it down to the top of the water tank where it will connect with a half inch 
NPT male pipe thread that connects directly into my water tank. And I use a little bit of that um, plumber's tape on each one of those threaded pipes. The gravity fed, um, that one specifically, it's a gravity thread inlet. Um, I'll put that one in the link well, in the description. For that, we used a barb fitting and the barb fitting connected to a vinyl hose. And from there, we, the barb fittings, you just attach them with those little adjustable stainless steel clamps. And that ran all the way down to the one and a half inch inlet on my freshwater okay uh, freshwater outlet so the freshwater outlets are on the bottom of the of the fresh tank um, obviously they're gonna be on the side where you don't have your elevation on one side you're gonna have the half inch male pipe thread the other side is where you have that one and a half inch threaded you don't want to puncture that one obviously otherwise you'll have to go in and, and seal that up i use half inch male pipe thread to pex piping and then immediately to a shutoff valve that's worth money right there let me tell you because i can't tell you how many times i've needed to shut my water off to fix something so then after the shutoff valve i'll continue my pex to my sediment filter my water pump the accumulator then immediately to another t that t drains out of the the truck basically that's for winterization if I ever need to either drain my water tanks or if I need to drain my pumps from there my piping tees at the water heater it continues to another T for the triple sink one for the coffee filter and I do add another ball valve before the coffee filter because that makes changing my coffee filters easier um, a note on the coffee filter I put the coffee filter after the bartender rinser uh, along that line I'll break off to the bartender rinser and then I'll break off to the coffee coffee filter and that's just so I'm not rinsing my dishes with filtered water it helps me preserve my filters a little bit I'm off on the other tee with the triple sink tee the piping continues basically to my hand washing sink and my uh, triple sink for both the cold waters and basically just you just spend the day dry fitting all that make sure everything fits uh, nice and well and that nothing's bent or under pressure and then the next day you come in and, and crimp everything down all right coming up next is gray water piping Okay, so here's a, another pro tip. The piping that's used in kitchen drains is a different type of piping than Schedule 40 PVC. Now, both of them will be one and a half inch. However, they don't fit each other. So you'll need some type of adapter. I tried to figure out what the name of kitchen drain sink piping is. I spent all kinds of time on Google to see if they have a specific name for it. I wasn't able to find everything. So um, for the rest of this video, you're gonna hear me call it kitchen drain piping, the PVC, PVC Schedule 40, I'll call it PVC Schedule 40. Oh, also another pro tip when it comes to kitchen drain sinks is they do sell kits for triple sinks to add a hand washing sinks, pretty straightforward. You know, you need to buy another T and then another tailpipe and an elbow and you can get your hand washing sink in there. With my hand washing sink, we also added in, we've got the tailpipe that has the little dishwasher outlet so that we can add the uh, bartender rinser to the dishwasher outlet. For gray water inlet, when you're coming off the piping under the kitchen sink, you're using that kitchen sink one and a half inch. And then I all of that will connect to my P-trap. And then the P-trap is where I converted to schedule 40. It gets a little tricky. Whenever you're doing this, you really want to make sure that you have your pipe cut, your tailpipes cut in such a way that there's some slope to drain. That way you don't have things clogging up. So it takes a little bit of practice getting in there to do that. Basically what you wanna do is you wanna have the piping sloped in such a way that when it reaches the gray water, it was at an elevation that allows for that gray water to drain out. In mine, my hand washing sink is slightly shorter than the sink right next to it, the first sink of my triple sinks. That um, triple sink, it's a little bit longer. The next triple, triple sink basin tailpipe is a little bit longer. The final triple sink tailpipe is even a little bit longer so that that bottom pipe is kind of at a, an angle and allows for it to slope. Then I put on my P-trap. After my P-trap, we vent. My county, my code and regulations allow for a studer vent. Studer vent is a small little vent that doesn't go up to the roof. Some of you may or may not have that. You might have to vent outside of your unit, which means either venting up to the roof or venting out your sidewall, in which case either way, the vent has to be capped and also needs some type of screen to prevent pest from coming in and laying eggs in your gray water. Gray water outlet. So this is on the bottom of my gray water. Obviously the outlet is at the opposite end than your elevation. So you still need slope to drain on your 
gray water, which means for us, we just use again, a painted two by four on the end that did not have the outlets. From the outlets, I used a one and a half inch threaded pipe um, that gets me right into the tank itself. And that one and a half inch will then go to schedule 40 PVC. And that schedule 40, I just use a series of elbows to get it out of my unit. Um, I went down through the floor and so use a hole saw to cut a hole slightly larger than the pipe itself. And then you just come back and silicone that. Once I'm underneath my unit, now I use a series of elbows at one and a half inch PVC to get my, my drain where I want it. So for us, I didn't want my drain sticking out. And I personally like my drain a little bit further back. If my drain is real close to the front of my unit, then I'm likely to scrape, you know, especially when you're coming up a driveway. So I like it a little bit closer back towards the uh, wheel well, and then I don't like my drain sticking out. So I used a three inch RV drain, and they have adapters that can go from one and a half inch schedule 40 pvc to three inch rv drains the reason i like the three inch rv drain allows you to dump your gray water at any rv site as long as that's um regulated by uh, allowed by your code and regulations just to attach everything i use the same aluminum tape that we use the straps to strap everything down so i use the same one and then I personally did a, I strapped a bunch under there. So I strapped the one and a half inch schedule 40 PVC. And then I also uh, strapped down the RV drain, both before the actual valve that comes off the RV drain, as well as after it. With the gray piping, you want to go through and dry fit everything. Once everything looks good, then it's time to set your primer and glue. And there's plenty of videos on YouTube on how to do primer and glue, but you just want to make sure you get all your shavings out, that everything's nice and clean. Everything dry fits well. There's not tension under the pipe and once everything looks good just um, glue it down and then I do like to use aluminum straps to counteract any movement of the pipes so I will uh, strap down the pipe from one direction as well as from another direction just to make sure that all my piping is in there nice and tight okay so then from there it really comes down to testing everything out so you got everything crimped down you got everything glued down you got everything tied down um, at that point you want to Work on both your inlets, put some water, three quarter inch, attach it to a garden hose with your gravity fed. You want to use you know, a bottle or something to drain water down and just look for any type of uh, leaks. No leaks look good and everything. You're able to fill up your fresh water tank. Then at that point, plug in your pump and turn your pump on and boom, the pump's going to go out to all your faucets. And that's where you're going to start seeing if there's leaks. Make sure you have rags. There's always leaks. I mean, no, no matter how well we think we're good at this stuff, every time I'll go to set it up and be like, no leaks this time. There's always some crimp somewhere that I forgot. So just make sure you have rags and stuff. You'll end up cleaning that water. And then, yeah, you want to basically turn on your faucets and make sure all your faucets work. You don't have any leaks in your faucets and that they drain down into your gray, fill up your gray and then just go outside and open up that valve on your RV drain and make sure everything flows out there without any leaks. Everything looks good. You're good to go. The last thing is the expansion valve on your hot water heater. That is something that is um, needed. Your plumber needs to put an expansion valve on there. So if you have a plumber friend or something, then you want to reach out to them and just make sure that you get that taken care of. There's a certain direction they need that to go. So anyway, so that's kind of the last thing. Um, that one's above my skill set. So I was just higher out on that one. Otherwise than that, that's pretty much it. Quite a long video so uh, you know forgive me for some of you folks that are dragging through this one but thank you so much for taking the time to watch through it um, again my name is Vincent I'm with Green Joe Coffee School and uh, I'll, I'll see you guys in for the next one